Is it one, two? Te oh, no, is it okay? All right, all right. Here we go. Everybody doing well by the grace of our Lord? Um, if this screen starts to flicker a little bit, just you know, point, go like that, and I'll think I'll remember what you're doing, <laughs> and hope that you're not telling me to change anything. Sister Magnolia, beautiful song. That's all we need. Amen. I don't want to leave out, leave out Sister Imani. Where are you at? Where she, she's back there. Sister, I'm going to use that for a sermon. Straight up. I'm going to use that for a sermon. I'm just like, I can't believe this little girl giving a little sermon. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The prayers that were submitted to. Thank you, sis. Everything, everything, everything is an element to the glory of the gospel. Would you say amen? amen. Again, we have a lot to cover. I want to welcome those that are able to, to please kneel, as it is my tradition for the Lord. <clears throat> those that are not able to, please just bow your heads and close your eyes. Our Father in heaven, as we now present ourselves as the living sacrifice, we ask, Lord, that you would take our minds, our hearts, and we do pray, we plead that you seal it for eternity. But we must understand, in order for that to happen, we need to be reformed. What good is a revival without, without the reformation? What good is it always trying to tell somebody to change, but yet we're not changing? Father, help us to understand you need us to change. If we have more of a focus on ourselves, our characters, Father, maybe, just maybe, a change can be wrought. Father, help us not to waste the time to force the change upon anyone else. If we're going to force anything, help us to force the change upon ourselves. So that, Father, when people see us, they will say, I want that. Because they know it only comes from Jesus. Now, Father, what we're going to talk about today, you know, Lord, you have placed this upon my heart and my mind. I know it's not going to be easy to swallow at times. It's going to prick the hearts. But that's what we're here for. To have a soothed message and do nothing, what good is it? I pray that, that you would anoint my lips this morning. And I pray, Lord, that the spirit of the lovely Jesus will be represented in such a way that when we leave here, we can say we have truly been filled. Let it not stay dormant here in this church. Help us to take it back home to really dwell to masticate upon these words thoroughly. And as the, it is digested, Father, we know, Lord, it's because you fed us. I ask, Lord, that now I know that I'm unworthy. Nothing that I say can penetrate the minds of anyone else, but I know that Jesus can. We're asking that your spirit be led. Use my heart, use my mouth, peace. And I pray, Lord, that people will say that you will love them. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's, it's my computer. It's my computer, actually. Okay. Okay. Can you get there? I'm not going to mess with it. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right. We begin. What's this here? If I can change it, right? What's this here? With a show of hands, who would like to be in this kingdom? Everybody's hands should go up. Well. That's what we're here for, right? Because Jesus is going to be the center of attention there, amen? However, with that question, I have a follow-up. And this is more of a statement. This comes from the Word of God. Please, I would encourage you to please write down the information and the sources that I cite the presentation with. It says here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, whosoever, what, everyone? His brother is a murderer, and ye know 
that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So my question is, you hate anyone, you have no eternal life, so would you be in there? Okay. Now, let's understand this word hate. That word, we think of it being like, Arr! no. It basically means to love less. Did you hear what I just said? And many of us say, I don't hate them, but I sure don't like them. Right? At least our attitude is that. But according to the text, he that loves less his brother is a what? Is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. I want you to understand that eternal life is Christ Jesus in. Doesn't Jesus I am the way, the truth, and the life? So that means you have no Jesus in you. And if you have no Jesus in you, if I have no Jesus in me, I'm going nowhere, folks. Are you with me? Now to the text that we're going to be dealing with for the rest of this segment here today. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. This is coming out of the last book of the Old Testament, the very last chapter, the very last two verses. Now the Bible says, and I want us all to read this verse, these two verses together, right? I want us to, to read it all in sync. One, two, three. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, is this a promise? It is a promise. Is it a, po a positive promise? Oh, yes, it is. Now, I want you to understand this is coming from the book of? That's in the Old Testament, right? So now you notice this is a prophecy. Yes or no? It's a prophecy, and with that being said, you have to understand that it's telling us about the soon coming of the Lord. Now, here when you look at this picture, this is Jesus, and these are the waiting ones, right? By show of hand, who wants to be part of this people that are waiting the coming of the Lord? I want to be that. Amen? I want to be numbered with that group. I've entitled today's message, Prophetic Reconciliation. Prophetic reconciliation. Now, I'm going to take you back to the Old Testament. I'm going to take you to the story of one of the great prophets that is mentioned that you may have heard of. Now, I want you to understand, this prophet had to speak at such a time that within his own people, there was a lot of contention. There was a lot of what, everyone? A lot of contention. There was a lot of issues taking place. So there were some people that wanted to follow God, which is the minute few, but the majority wanted to follow the ways of the world. They wanted to be replicating what the world was doing, the other nations, if you will. There was tension at that time with Ahab, which represented Israel, and Elijah, which represented the true followers of God. Would you agree with that notion? Okay? So you had it. So dealing with First Kings chapter 16 through 18. Now, we understand that Elijah, the prophet of God, was given a word from the Lord that he was to present his case to Ahab while they were worshiping the false idols. Remember that? And then he told them, when we prophesied, well, what was going to happen? What was it? When Elijah went to Ahab, the initially, there was going to be no rain for how long? Three and a half years, yes or no? Now, if there's no rain, as you can see anywhere else, when there's a lack of rain, especially for three and a half years, what happens? Plants die, salvation, yes or no? Because there's a famine in the land. That would then probably induce people to come back to God. Because now you feel that you have a need. Yes or no? Please understand why this was happening. On top of that, it's because they remained on their covenant with their Lord and Savior. Amen? You agree with that, right? During this time, that prophet had to stand even when he felt that he was standing alone. You remember that? Now, remember, Elijah represents not only himself, but the true people of God. Remember that one time that he felt and later on, granted, he felt that he was alone. Remember that? And God had to rebuke him. What did God say to him? There are 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. Don't think that you're alone in this. Doesn't that happen sometimes? And sometimes you feel like you're alone in something, and God has to rebuke you. What do you think? You're special? That you're better than anybody else? That you're the only one that's going through this? 
Let me remind you, if you open your Bible and you study it as you should have, you would have known that many people have gone through something worse than what you have. This man loved the Lord. Amen? And you know that God was about to use him to bring on one of the greatest revivals of his time. Remember when all the false prophets of Baal and all the false prophets of Jezebel were called upon what mount? Mount Carmel, right? Who can tell me? Raise your hand. Don't blurt it out. And usually when I say this, the adult doesn't know how to listen. How many prophets in total were there? Wait. Nope. You're close. Well, yeah, you, you look, look at that. What did I say? Yes, brother. She said that as well. Go ahead. 850. 850 false prophets to one. Now, you need that many prophets? <laughs> he called him. He said, bring all of your people. And meet me on my turf. Are you hearing me? Because if, if you remember when Obadiah tried to come to him, because you know Ahab has been looking for you, he said, you know what, tell Ahab, Ahab that Elijah is here. He's going to come here. Amen? I don't have to go to, he's going to come here. And did Ahab do that? Oh, you better believe it. He showed up there. <clears throat> he told the false prophets to do what? Go call upon their God. Remember that? And he gave them all day to do it. Remember, they had built up an altar. He said, listen, if you can spot this with the fire from heaven, that's your true God. And all day, he's listening to all of their teachings, all their callings. Did their God show and appear? And then he starts to taunt them. Remember that? <laughs> I just couldn't imagine what Elijah was saying. And I'm sure while he was saying those words, those people were getting really heated at that brother. I'm sure they wanted to kill that brother. Right? But, you know, it's interesting. I would also assume that some of them were coming to the realization, <laughs> we've been worshiping a false god. That's what a revival does. Are you with me? Okay. So, when he gave them their time, and they did not produce what they were supposed to produce, the Lord says, now it's your turn. And what he does is that he erects that altar, remember? Erects them into an altar by hand. They were not to chisel altars, remember that. The reason why was what? Because heathens did that. Are you following me? Heathens did that. Okay? So he wrecks this, um, this, um, this altar, and what does he command the Israelites to do? Clean the false rock. What? Take four barrels and pour water upon it how many times? Three times. And there was a trench around it. That's how much water they put, put upon the altar. Yes or no? And then what happens? The man of God prays. Amen? And what comes down from heaven? The fire came down from heaven. That can surely make a believer if you ask me. Amen? I mean, if you get, if you drench in wet and the fire comes and sucks you up, I mean, that make you a believer? I don't know you. I don't know if you survive that. But this situation here, this occurrence, was going to be one of the greatest revivals. And right after that, remember, you know the, the, the story, that now the rain was going to come. Yes, no. He sent his servant to go check it how many times? Seven times. Seven times we know that the, start, the cloud started to what? Build up itself, started to get blackened. He told Ahab what he needed to do, and God produced the rain. Amen? Remember the former and the latter rain. This is the spirit of God moving. Would you say amen? God was about to bless Israel again. He needed a revival. But he also needs a what? A reformation. Would you say to amen to that? There's no way, and you, you, if you notice, there's a lot of churches that you notice opposed to, or science revival, 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 but you never see the word reformation. Amen. Unfortunately, sometimes in our churches, you hear more of reformation without the revival. Have you noticed that? A reformed church, a reform. But where's the revival? Where's the love of God? One of the scariest churches to be in is a full-blown re uh, reformed church that has no true revival. Are you telling me? Are, are you hearing me? Because they will hate you. 
Because if it's not done their way, you will be ousted. This revival that took place was to turn these hearts of these people back to God. But I want you to understand something. Even though God wrought a miracle, something still needed to happen. For all of this was really to really be nailed down. This is what the Bible says. And Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and did what to them? The false prophets of Baal, yes or no? Now, I need you to understand something. Before God can really bring in that full work in you, you have to take out the false prophets of your life. You got to take out that sin in your life if you're ever going to see the true change in, uh, in your body. Would you say amen? The only way that we're going to see it is when we surrender all to Jesus. 99% saved is 100%. You know it. And that was the message that Elijah was trying to give to the people. God does not want to forsake us. We make him forsake us by our own choosing. Am I right with that? Say amen if I'm right, or, or, I'm not right with that. Now let's go back to our main text this here. It says here, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, Behold, that means everybody, look, I will what? I will send you who? Elijah the prophet before the coming and dreadful day of the Lord. Hmm, dreadful day of the Lord? It says here, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming dreadful day of the Lord, and this prophet, the message of the world, is going to turn the what? Hearts of the fathers to their and the children's hearts to the earth. Then listen to this. Thus I smite the earth with a. We'll get to that in a minute. Who and what was this verse referring to? Raise your hand if you know the answer. Yes, my brother. Very good, but you're still in the thumb because I'm not going that far, but you're right. Initially, what did it refer to? John the Baptist. Very good. Did you hear that? This was a Malachi writing. The prophet Malachi points to John the Baptist. Are you following me? Don't miss this because you're going to learn something here this morning. Now, let's prove this. I'm taking you to the book of Luke, chapter 1. Please write it down. Chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1, 5, 11 through 16. Just to hit on points. The Bible says, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zach Zacharias, of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the children of Aaron, I'm sorry, the daughters of Aaron, and her name was, and then appeared unto him an, an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him, the Bible says. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, who? Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name? Was he a miracle child? Yes, there was other people in the Bible that were miraculously born as well, yes? Who was the main one that we know of? Jesus. Sam, I mean, Samson, there we go. Samson. Abraham and Sarah gave birth to? Okay. So this was another miracle child. Would you say amen? Now, it says here, because remember, her, her, her womb was barren as well. She was older, rather. It goes on to say, and thou, listen to this, and thou shalt have joy in what? And many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. By the way, let me just restate this point. You don't want to miss our after meeting, our after meal meeting. Did you hear what I just said? I know a lot of us like to go straight home and we ought to go to sleep. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. There's people that are going to be coming to these churches are going to want more, are going to want more, are going to want more. While a lot of us are sleeping, even in church. And let me throw this in. This is one part of the message, but let me throw this in. You know the spirit of poverty condemns us whenever we do sleep in the church? You know why she says that? Because we don't sleep when it comes to all the things that we want to do. That's why she says. So why do we come to church and start sleeping here? Amen. I'm sorry. I have to say it. Okay? Now, let's read this following verse. Pay attention. And many of the children of Israel shall heed to the Lord their... Now, again, let's try this again. Raise your hand if you know what the word turn means. Raise your hand. Yes, sister. 
Mm -hmm. Close. I saw another hand here. Nobody else? Anybody else? Okay, you agree with her? You're right. You're, you're right. Okay. No, no, go ahead. Yes. 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 Look at Jezebel's prophets. It was a total of all of them all together. You were right. That's what I said. You were right. Oh, somebody else said. Okay. So it was a total of what, though? All of them together. All of them together. Are you with me? Thank you, sis, for that. All right. Now, going back to the word, turn. Anybody else want to take a stab at it? They're right. They're right. Yes. You're even getting closer. This is what it means to convert. I'm sorry, I beat you to it. To convert. To do what? To convert. To convert. So I need you to understand to continue on with this, this meeting here this morning. With the type of spirit of reconciliation, first, what we're finding here is what needs to first take place within you and I. We talked about revival reformation, but it's a personal revival and reformation that needs to take place, right? We'd like to have the church to have around a revival and a reformation. The problem is, is that we don't understand that the church is made up of individuals. Amen? Thank you. Imperfect individuals. In Christ, we can become perfect. Amen? In Christ, not without him. Now, the spirit of reconciliation first that we're finding is the spirit of reconciliation with God. With who, everyone? Now, that spirit of reconciliation is going to produce something, and this is what it is. <laughs> the spirit of forgiveness and reconciliation. Would you agree with that? Okay? It's the spirit of what, anyone? And what? So let's really hand on this point real quick. Going back to John the Baptist. Now, I'm going to take you to the book of uh, Matthew chapter 3 now, verse 7 and 8. I'll pay close attention. Because we know, still talking about John the Baptist, what was he out there in the Jordan doing? He was baptizing people, right? Baptizing people. And you notice, I want you to notice the parallels. They came out of the Jordan to get baptized. Remember Elijah? Tell Ahab, I am here. Did you catch that? I want you to understand the spirit that's taking place is the same thing that you find taking place in 1 Kings. Are you, are you following me so far? This is what the Bible says here. But when, the, when he saw many of the you notice it starts off with what? You notice anybody say, but. I'm sorry, but. When you hear the word but, you know something ain't right. Right? But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of lovers, O generation of vipers who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. I want you to notice that. Flee from the what? Pray for therefore fruits meet for what? That's what John the Baptist is telling them. Yes or no? Now, I want you to understand, where, who, what are the two groups that are highlighted here? Don't fall asleep on me. Y'all better not fall asleep on me. Hey, I have yet to preach a sermon right next to somebody sitting down to wake them up. What are the two sects of um, people here? The sect of Judaism. Yes or no? Let's talk a little bit about the sex of Judaism, okay? Sex of Judaism. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to mention some of them, but there are many more. But these are the main ones, and some of them you probably never heard of. First, we're going to start off with the Sadducees. The what, everyone? And then, secondary, we're going to deal with the? And then, thirdly, we're going to deal with the? Essenes. And then, fourthly, the Herodians. And then, you probably heard of this, the Zealots. Anybody heard of the Zealots? And then lastly, the common people. Now, how many are up there? There's six up there. Now, I want you to understand there are many other factions, but these are the ones that we're going to briefly touch on. Is that clear? Are we okay with that? Let's get into it. The, word for, uh, the main uh, group of the Pharisees. Now, I'm taking this out of the same day I've done the Bible commentary, so you can get it and catch it yourself. And I also went uh, extending to that online to try to add some more information to get a little bit of understanding. It says here, the Pharisees were the most numerous and wealthy sect of the Jews. Now, oh, before, uh, before I, I, I um, continue on, I, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Are you ready for this? I'm going to ask you to see where you fit in. That's a challenge. 
So as I read this law, I want you to say, well, that's me. No, not me, but this one's me. You fell into one of these categories. Are you with me? All right, so check this out. Dealing with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the most numerous and wealthiest sect of the Jews. Anybody here wealthy? They derived their name from the Hebrew word farash, which signifies to what? To what, anyone? Anybody here? Or to separate because they separated themselves from the rest of their countrymen and professedly devoted themselves to special strictness in religion. Anybody here? Now raise your hands. Let's move now to the Sadducees. The Sadducees were taught the duty of serving God disinterestedly without the hope of reward or the fear of what? They also believed that there was no future state of rewards or punishments. The other notions which they held all to be traced to the lead, this leading doctrine were, well, I'll give you three points here, that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit. Matthew 22, 23, Acts 23, verse 8. And that the soul of man perishes with the, soul, with the body. Number two, they rejected the doctrine of fate or decrees. Did you read that? Did you catch that? And number three, they rejected all traditions and professed to receive only the books of the Old Testament. Did that happen in our church? I'm only going to read the Bible. Forget the spirit of Bible. Amen? That happens, right? Which one do you fall in? This is probably conservative, so I don't think it's really going to apply to many people here. Now, let me give you an example out, out of this, which was mentioned here, Acts 23, verse 8. So you can see what's taking place. Listen to this, because this is from his own countrymen. Are you with me? Acts 23, verse 7 and 8. It says here, and when he had no, so said, there arose what, everyone? Between the what? Let's stop there. There was dissension between who? I thought they're from the same church. I thought they're from the same church. And look at this. It says here, and the multitude was what? But they're from the same church. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So you notice there's a doctrinal difference. Does that happen in our church? Which one do you fit in? Let's move forward. The Essenes. Now, this one really got me. It says here, the Essenes were Jewish monks or what? Anybody heard it here? Only come out when they need something? They go back into the cubby hole? Remember that? Anybody right here? Listen to this. Listen to this. Listen to this. Passing their time little in society, but mostly in places of obscurity and retirement. They denied themselves in a great measure the usual comforts of life. Does it ring a bell to anybody? And were exceedingly strict in the observance of the duties of religion. They were generally more pure than the rest of the Jews and appeared to have been an, an, an unambitious, a modest, a retired sort of people. Anybody modest? In regard to doctrine, they did not differ materially from the Pharisees, except that they objected to the sacrifices of slain animals and, of course, did not visit the temple. And it goes on and on and on to talk about them. Mind you, I want you to see where you fit in. You probably by now said, I'm done. I'm done. There's no saying no more. The Herodians is not much as talked about them, but a little known as it said, the Herodians were apparently interested almost in solely in what? Oh my goodness. We got some of those in the church? Little no is known of them beyond casual references in the New Testament and the references them. And then lastly, the common people. Now, let me give you the scriptural evidence to this. Listen to this. It says here, many of the people, therefore, when they heard the saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a what again? Among the what? because of him, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Folks, that's the common people. That was then, if you didn't include yourself in any of the previous group, you became part of this one. Yes, sis. Oh, yes, I did. I did forget about the zealous. My bad. You're paying attention, sis. I have to watch this sister here, and then you're not in your head, too. Oh, my goodness. I got, that one should have warned me about this. They were like nothing but over their heads. 
because that was very good sister that I, I extracted it from here i guess when i edited the, the information but i want you to know the zealots were what we call christian nationalists you know what christian nationalists are do you know what christian nationalists are we just saw that not too long ago you ever heard what was the brother that you did we, we talked about not too long ago what's his name um gary um, greg lock you ever heard greg lock you see him that they're going to take the kingdom by force and these preachers today that they're going to believe they, they hold to the Bible and to their gun. They're going to um, become nationalists, Christian nationalists. These were Jewish nationalists. They're going to take the kingdom by force. That was their attitude. What, it is believed that what, Cyprus were, were a zealot. What was his name? Simon the Zealot, right? So he has an attitude that, no, we're going to take the kingdom by Thank you, sis, for that information. I'm going to watch out for you ladies now. But no, thank you. That helps me to raise her in on this. Thank you, sis. Thank you so much. Both of you, yes. All right. All right. So uh, my point here that I want to derive from this um, particular text, you notice, what is the word here? Even with the common people. You notice that there's separation all around? There's division? But don't they belong to one church? Do we have that problem here today, too? I want you to understand what's taking place is the spirit of hatred in the same church. It says here, according to 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21, if any man say, I love God, I love who? And hate with his brother. What does the word hate again mean? To love less is what? He is a what? That goes for everybody that is in here. How do you and I claim that we love God, but we love less our brother? And you're going to give us an example. Check this out. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? How do you even tell you know somebody, you know somebody you never even saw, but the one that you see every Sabbath, you will, but you, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And this commandment have we, have we from him that he who loveth God love his brother also. In other words, you cannot separate these two. Follow me. Say amen if you follow me. Okay? So you notice you need to have both, both of them joined together. Yes or no? Considering what we read earlier in the first um, 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 statement, or rather the passage of Scripture, he that has hate will not enter into or will not have eternal life in him. Yes or no? So, folks, do you understand this? Well, we're understanding what we're dealing with, folks, and I'm telling you, this is plaguing our church. It's plaguing us as individuals. And I've said it over and over last night, said it earlier this morning, I'm going to repeat it again. Because if we don't get this straight, we're not going nowhere. The spirit of hatred is what we're seeing, what we're seeing in the time of John the Baptist. Spirit of hatred and what? Which equals to factions in the church. Malachi said, I need to get this right with my people. Are you with me? Now, it's interesting, studying this out, I, saw, you know, I, have, I have a whole library. Um, Ernie, Kim, you know, you've seen my stuff. Um, I just have, I love to read. I'm a bookaholic. I'm a bookworm, if you will. And um, I just love to read what other sources have said. Now, there's a man by the name of Albert <clears throat> Barnes. He was a theologian, and he wrote in the 1800s, if you will, and um, he wrote, he commented on this particular passage of um, scripture. Now it's interesting what, what, what I was able to pull from, uh, from his writings. Listen to this, this is what he had to say. In reference to what we're reading from, when it connects, uh, we're dealing to Luke chapter one and, Luke, and Matthew chapter three, dealing with John the Baptist and what was his mission, what he was doing. Now listen to this, pay very close attention. Okay, listen to this. He says, in the time of John, the Jews were what everyone? Into a number of different what? They were opposed, once again, to who? And pursued their opposition with great. Did you catch that? In the time of John, when he came to preach this message, to prepare the way for who? For Jesus, what was taking place? There was, there was division, and people were at each other, and they had great what? Is it happening again today? Understand this, you might be talking about. 
Now, folks, I talked about what happened in the time of John. Now let's see if this is making its way now in our days. Who remembers the 2016? What was happening in 2016? Well, let me, huh? Very good. The presidential election, remember? Many people that complain less about politics, even children started to rise up and say, I want to vote this way. I want this, right? Yes or no? Was that happening? Yes. And a lot of people that could care less about these parties started to now equal themselves to one party or the other. Yes or no? Because of these two figures that were there. Yes or no? Was there a lot of tension happening in our nation? Was there? Yes, there was. You notice that our nation started to go against each other. Now, let's take that into account to what's taking place at uh, the time of John the Baptist. There's a lot of tension. Yes or no? Yes. Albert Barnes goes on to say this. He says, it was what? Listen to this, because this really hit home to me. It was impossible but that this opposition should find its way into what? Woo! And divide parents and children from what? Did that happen in 2016? Was that causing division even in families? Check this out. Al Jazeera.com had this to say back in their time. Clinton or Trump, U.S. families divided over what? Families across the country have been swept up in their own political torrents during the tumultuous what? Did you catch that? It goes on to say, listen, the article goes on to say, Abadam Molesky, I guess that's how I was saying, an associate professor of psychology at the Cookstown University of Pennsylvania, told Al Jazeera that the vitriol in the political system is creating a level of tension that is clearly impacting family dynamics in destructive ways. Not in positive ways, but in what? You guys are starting to remember what happened in your families, right? Or suicide in your family. Yes or no? Okay? Goes on to say, he explained that the polarizing nature of this campaign in particular is leading to an increase in political tension within the candidates at this time around, this time around have really triggered aversive reactions. It's become very personal in families. Did that happen? If you believe that your parent, brother or sister, will be voting for a candidate who will usher in the end of the world, family harmony, listen to this, will take a back seat to the survival of the planet. Did you hear that? In other words, your family is second to this issue. I'm going to stand. And if you don't stand with me, listen, there was divisions even in homes. Yes or no? Was there divisions in homes? Even went into the churches. I went to churches. Yes or no? And while this is all migrating itself and it's coming and it's building this momentum, we get that it's now this nation in 2020. What happened in 2020? So it was riots. You see what was, the spirit of hatred was building up. You see that? The spirit of hatred. And never in my lifetime did I ever see stuff like this. Not across the nation, I haven't. Not in my lifetime. This was happening in your own backyard. In other words, Satan was moving to rip the nation apart. But I want you to understand, before the nation is ripped apart, he has to get into the families. Jesus said this, and when what? Iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That's why you see what's happening today in our world. Because the lack of love is being manifested. And I want, you, I want, to, make, I want to make this very clear, folks. Many of us in the church... God's remnant the church are lacking the love and the spirit of Christ. I'm going to push them a little bit further. That's including conservative lines. We could be so bitter at people that are so liberal. It's interesting. You know, when I read the Bible, Matthew chapter 9 says, I come not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Oh, and by the way, he was sitting by the drunks, the prostitutes, and all those other people. Let a prostitute walk in our doors and see how we react. Let her be for about a week or two, and let's see her attire. And I'm sure nobody's going to want to be around her. But I thought this church was the, was the um, what did you say earlier? Was the hospital. But remember what I said. We're the doctor, supposedly. We're going to get ready to medicate her. Isn't that how it works? 
And we're going to be real. We're going to be honest. That's usually what, what, what happens. But you know what? The Apostle Paul already told us that things like this is going to happen. The lack of love that we're going to have. Listen to this. You know the scripture. First, I mean, Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Know this also, that in the what days? Who believes here that we're living in the last days? What's the next word that you see there? Perilous. What does perilous mean? Dangerous times. Dangerous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, brat, um, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to what? Do we have that now today? And listen, the way the system is working, they want to protect your children above you. Mind you, you feed them, you clothe them, and let it be that you don't take care of them what they're going to do to you. It, it, you, did, you did you hear what I just said? You don't take care of your kids, they're going to lock you up. But yeah, you beat the kids. No, let me take that back. You spank your kids, and you got arrested. You know what my mother told me when I was young? Let them come and take me, I go to jail. You ain't never going to ever disrespect me in front of nobody. My, that comes from a short woman. That woman put the, that even says it could put the fear in my life right, compared to this woman. That woman, I said it's not something I was at the camp. She can say in Spanish culture, we call a thing called chancleta. You know what chancleta means? This is a sandal. In a Spanish culture, that's one of the best usage of, uh, 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 of a paddle, if you will. You'll take it because we're not stupid. As young boys, we're not stupid. We got to be away before we get some respect. So they say, oh, yeah, pick it up, and they know how to catch you on the forehead with those thick. I want you to notice it says here, unthankful, unholy, without what? That's the lack of love, folks. That's the lack of love. And listen to this. It goes on to say, choose bakers. Didn't we talk about something like that earlier? You're, you're basically betraying. False accusers, incontinent, fierce, despised of those that are what? Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Did you test that? Is that happening today? But listen to what the next section says. Having a form of godliness, but denying the, the, but, but the power thereof, from such what? I need you to understand this. You know what this means? The church. The church is having a form of godliness, but what? The mind the power of the You know what he says? Stay away from those people. Because they will affect you. Remember when we talked about gossipers, about terrorists, and about all these people that want to go ahead and strangle everybody that doesn't do their things their way? Stay away from those people. And sometimes when you do, you know you're going to risk it. You know what we deal with a lot? Uh, what? We have a lot of Adventist nar narcissists. A lot of Adventist gaslighters. Go on, say amen. You know the truth. You gonna invite me back here? I'm gonna move. Oh, I don't want that. I don't want that. This brother said he told me said Ernest brother uh, Ernest said, "Listen, they typically have a bell when they are, I guess when they are shifting from Sabbath school." He said they told him not to do it. You know when I was preaching, I said, "Thank God, yeah, I didn't do that." Because if it was my wife, she'd be like, ding, 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 ding. having a form of godliness, but, depend, but denying the power thereof, from such to turn away. Are you with me? Folks, this is what was happening also in John's time. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the, 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 Her uh, the Herodians, the Zealots, they had, a they had a form of godliness, but denying this Christian the spiritual power that should convert people. Are you with me? And what did he say? Stay away from them. Malachi, back to Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you who? The prophet, <clears throat> before the coming and death of the day of the Lord, and he shall do what? Now we're going to get into the meat of the subject here. This is the focus of attention. Father in heaven, I pray, if there's anything they missed, that they do, we do not miss this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We should everybody read it, please. Now we're gonna bring it home. We're gonna bring it home. <clears throat> Listen to what Jesus said, and you tell me that we, if today it doesn't fit the bill. This is out of Jesus' own mouth. Listen to this. <clears throat> According to the book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 52 and 53. For, from henceforth there shall be five in one house. What? Talking about your own household. 
three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, and the mother against the what? And the daughter against the what? And the mother-in-law against her? And the daughter-in-law against her? Now, I always question this. Is it the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law and all this? Listen, sometimes mother-in-laws need to stay out of the business of their children's affairs. Amen? If you will do that, you will never, you will not be looked like as outlaws. Amen? You don't want to be, you want to be looked like as an outlaw? No, I don't. Okay? So try to stay away from their, from their business unless you know what you really do by the Spirit of God intervene. Amen? Sometimes. But let God deal with a lot of the problems. All right? And some of us baby our kids so much that anything happens, they want to run to us for everything. But now we're going to, listen, you, you, you raised yourself a little chump boy. <laughs> Why did they call me to come here to give y'all this message? I don't know for the life of me. <clears throat> you see that God, Jesus said, there's going to be issues in your own home here. You see that? And I want you to think about that was what John the Baptist was facing. Not only the division from the people of Israel to God, but now also, more importantly, the issues and the division between the home. Husbands against the wives, wives against the husbands, children against the parents, the parents against the children. Are you following me? This is what he's saying. This is what's going to happen in the last days. Back now, now, now we're dealing with this clause from um, um, Malachi chapter four, verse five and six. More predominantly, we're speaking about verse six. Now let's end on this because now verse seventeen of Luke chapter one is going to nail it down for us. Listen to this. It says here, and he shall go, John the Baptist, because we left off in verse 16. And he shall go, talking about John the Baptist, before him in the spirit and power of who? Who's that again? Did we read about him? Okay, now listen to this. To do what? What does the Lord turn mean? The hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedience to the wisdom of the judge and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now that we match it, who was going to go before them to do that? In the spirit of who? No, 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 no. It was John the Baptist in the spirit of who? So Malachi, listen to this, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, was a prophetic statement in reference to John the Baptist and his mission. But this has a twofold application, folks. Are you with me? Because was Jesus coming at the time of John the Baptist? That was his first coming. Is Jesus coming again? Folks, you need to understand this. What you see here needs to happen again. Are you hearing me? So we, tell, we talked about the first side of it. The spirit of reconciliation dealt with what again? First one. Reconciling to who? Very good. Reconciling with God. Next now, what needs to take place is with each other. Are you with me? Are you following me, folks? If you are missing one out of the two, you're not making reconciliation. Now, as a Christian, you're not. Now, it's very interesting. When I was studying this out, I said, Lord, but I know you're opening these up to me, but what, what, what are you really trying to tell me? How can I give this an example to the people whenever I preach them? He goes, Ernest, come on, think very hard. Is there any? I said, Lord, but you got to help me. Give me an example of how this reconciliation process works. And then he gave it to me. Have ever heard of the story of the prodigal son? I said, Lord, I did not realize this. See, many of us, when we read the story, we're thinking about the father toward the son. Think about Malachi, right? Fathers to the what? Fathers to the what? And the children to the? Now, you see that here, but it's beyond that. Now, you know the story. But one of the children, all hot-headed, hot, hot, hot said, I know better than my parents. Anybody ever did that? I'm talking to the adults here. I'm not talking to the children. Knew better than what the parent was doing. I mean, what the parent has said. Said, I want to do it my way. Give me my inheritance. And I'm just going to show you that I know how to live my life. And this child, one of the two sons, went out there and started to go to this town. And he started to spend. He started to find crowds, started to find friends. And folks, young people, listen to me. Listen to me. Let me let you in on something. I come from the mindset that I knew what I was doing. And God said, don't worry. I'm going to help you. I'm going to have you rock bottom to let you know you know nothing. The reason why I'm here today is for two reasons. A mother's prayer, and because I had to hit rock bottom. And I believe I hit rock bottom because of my mother's prayer. Are you with me? Encouraging to the parents, please. This man went out there to live his life, right? He found friends. 
You know, the ones that make you feel good? The ones that say, you know what, I'm your friend because you got $100 in your pocket. You driving that nice Mercedes, right? Oh, you know, we're going to be home to the end, right? Divide and die, right? That's, I'm sorry, I'm speaking language of the streets. I'm sorry. Okay? But this man was living the life. He had supposed friends. He was giving them food. He was taking them out to eat. He, who knows what else he was doing? Taking them out to the movie theaters, taking them out to anywhere else. And they were his friends, right? Until he lost everything. The Bible says it was a famine in the land. Think about this again. Famine in the land. Did we talk about that? A famine again. Now, I know I want you to notice. When the famine kicked in, did he have any money? Was he hungry? To the point that he was going to do what? He had to find work to eat. They hired him. And they said, listen, I need you to do what? Be the swine. Now, I need you to understand this. When the Bible coins in the word swine, that's letting the reader know he, went, he dropped to the lowest of the lowest of the lowest. Because swine, pigs, are detestable in the Jewish uh, uh, economy. Yes or no? Okay, so now, I need you to understand this. Now, let's read some of the passage of scripture. We're going to understand this. Are you with me? Everybody still up today? Amen? Uh, are we good? Or are you being blessed this morning? All right, now, it says this. Listen to the story. And when he came to himself, he said, how many high servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare? And I perish what? with what? I will what? Arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Did he say that? I need you to understand how the process works. Because this is what the Bible says. According to Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24, Therefore, if thou bring thy gifts to thy altar, and there remember that thy brother has all against thee, leave there thy gifts before the altar, and go thy way. First be what? To who? God. And then come and offer your gift to your brother. Does, is that what it says? Listen to me. Because a lot of us make that mistake here. I have an issue with a brother from the church, but I'm just going to go to God and apologize to God. You know what the word, if I'm going to, now correct me if I'm wrong. Tell me if I'm wrong. If I read this correctly, and it's in the immediate context, it's telling me, God is saying, don't come to me if you haven't gone to your brother to get right. So guess what, folks? I hate to say it to you, a lot of us have been playing church. We've been playing church. Amen. We've been playing church. You know that you have, you have, you have a squabble with somebody, but you have already come to God and for forgive, but you have not gone to that person. Is it hitting right now? You know why? Because this reconciliation has to deal with apology. And a lot of us don't know how to do that. Or at least doesn't, doesn't want to do it. But the question is, reconciled with who? I'm going to give you three categories here. First category that I'm going to give you is the general people who hurt you. That's co-workers, neighbors, friends, etc. Should you make reconciliation with a lot of these people? Of course, as Christians, you should. I'm not talking about the people outside the church. I'm not in the church. Secondary, members of the what? Am I hitting home? You don't want me to go further? <clears throat> and then lastly, we have members of the family, the immediate or exterior. Examples, parents towards children, husbands towards wives, or vice versa. Now, I have to ask a question. Typically, what do you know is the reason why there's no reconciliation with people in any of these categories? Why do you, what is the main word? And that is your worst enemy. Did you hear what I just said? When you have problems in your, in your household and you don't want to ad, admit your fault, that's because of problems. And I'm going to tell you something. The more that I work with, uh, with couples... I find, unfortunately, I find pride more existent with the husband than with this uh, wife. But that's not exempting y'all women either. Because y'all could be a tough cookie too. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you guys can be very hard, man. I'll be surprised. Man, my goodness. Y'all don't break with nothing, man. I'll be like, man. You know what I'm saying? But you notice that pride, if, it, if you have pride, it affects you in your way of life, in your, in your dealings with people. Are you following me, church? That is your worst enemy. Years ago, when I was, I was a, 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 a teenager, I remember my uncle told me this. I'll never forget. He goes, Ernest, I'm going to tell you something. Pride is your worst enemy. Pride is your worst enemy. Give me some scripture. This is coming from the ESV. 
version. I don't usually hold to other these versions, but sometimes when he tries to bring out the text a little bit more clear, not dissecting, or, not, or rather, rather, not destroying what, the, what I believe the King James Version does say, it says here, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll include it. When pride comes, then comes what? But with hum the humble is what? So if you have pride, what happens then? Anybody in here likes to feel disgraced? Get rid of pride. Proverbs, <clears throat> chapter 16, verse 18. Pride goeth before what? And a haughty spirit before what? So let me understand it. What is this? If you have that, what happens? And what else? Anybody here wants destruction? You want to fall? Get rid of pride. Going back to that man, a famous man that I quoted earlier today, Henry Ford. Listen to what he says about pride. A man given to pride is usually proud of the wrong thing. <clears throat> Is that true? <laughs> if you hide them, folks, are we going to this kingdom? I don't believe so. At least I don't believe so. <clears throat> Faith I live by, page 68. Listen to this. Whenever pride, whenever what? And ambition or indulge, their life is what? For what? Feeling no need closes the heart against the infinite blessings of heaven. Folks, when you and I can't reconcile with people, you close the blessings of heaven. I know we can play church. I know we got that. I know we got that. We, we, listen, we nail that down. We nail that down. We can come with a nice suit. We can smell clean. We can even brush our teeth. It doesn't matter if he to God. He reads the heart. Amen? And goes on to say, pride of heart is a fearful trait of what? Pride goes before destruction. We just read that. This is true in the what? In the what? In the what? God hates pride. Could it mean that he hates you? Now I'm going to give you, uh, who ever heard of this book, The Five Apology Languages? Got one here. Got one there. I will encourage everybody. Now, this is not for my faith, but it's a lot of good points. Anybody here has a problem with apology? I I'm asking a question. Anybody here has a problem with apology? I did that purposely because I, I knew people were going to raise their hand. I did that purposely. Only got a little hand and ran up all the way in the back. Praise the Lord. I have a problem with apology. I do too. I do. I don't like to be wrong. Who likes to be wrong? You like to be wrong, Josh? <laughs> I'm going to read three statements periodically as we continue on with this segment, okay? All right, now listen to this. Out of this book, this. The first statement I, I derived from this book. And folks, you got to understand, I got to understand how to deal with people and catch certain things. Now, we got the spirit of poverty, amen. I got the Bible, number one, amen. We got the spirit of poverty. You know what a, what a good a book to always have? Mind, character, and personality. Both volumes. That will really help people with pride, have people with personal issues. Are you with it? Who's read that book or at least read that? Is it? It's a wonderful book. You should get it. So don't, please don't misunderstand. I'm trying to top for that those books with this, but I'm trying to say in addition. Are you with me? In addition. Now listen to the statement. The partner, you see if you fit this this statement. The person who refuses to recognize the need for an apology will have a life filled with broken what? Why you have broken relationships? It may just be that. It could be with your spouse, with your children, with the church members. It could be with exterior forms of your family, your mother, your father, your, your cousins. It may just be that. Oh, let me warn you, though. Pride will tell you, no, it's not that. It's them. That's what pride will tell you. If pride is telling you that, guess who's really telling you that? So Satan now has become your God. Going back to the text about, about the prodigal son. Now, here's it here. Okay, I'm, I'm having you flow with this segment, with, with what's taking place. And he arose, that's the prodigal son, and came to his what? But when he was yet a great far off, his father saw him and had what, everyone? And did what? And fell on his neck and did what? And then it goes on to say, and the son said unto him, Father, I have what? Sin against heaven, and in thy sight am in no more worthy to be called what? Thy son. Second statement from that book. Listen, now this one, listen to this one. Requesting what? It's especially difficult for those people who have a strong controlling personalities. <laughs> Why did I just hear crickets now? 
Let me read that again. Requesting, requesting forgiveness. By requesting, you're actually saying, I'm sorry, but that's after the sorry. And then now you're supposed to do another thing. You're to request what? So when you ask somebody for forgiveness, rather you say sorry, you follow up by saying, will you forgive me? Are you following me? Some of you like to drop, no, I already asked, said sorry. So that, no, you got to proceed a little bit further. Because now you're trying to work with the heart of that one that you offended. <laughs> Requesting forgiveness is especially difficult for those people who have strong and controlling personalities. Folks, I'm telling you something. If we don't get this right, again, I submit to you, we are going nowhere. Going back to the text. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Is there a household that's happy here? Is there a household that's happy? Check this out. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, Who would like to come to the Lord and ask him for forgiveness? Anybody here? But if you fail forgiving your brother, your husband, your wife, your children, God won't forgive you. Could it be scary that some of us are going to be lost just for this? Not that they kill somebody, not because they raped somebody, not because they lied in court, but just because of this. I'm telling you why. Because they adore pride more than the love of God. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have any what? What's another word for curl? Curl. What? A fight, right? Against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So you have any issues within your household, they're right. If you have issues within the church, get it right. But get it right. Because God also sent his son to get it right with you. Amen? Now, we're talking about spirit of reconciliation, yes or no? Now, the thing that God really pulled out of all of this, the story of the prodigal son, is actually four points. How many? Don't miss this. Write these down. The four points that I find, is, which is a four-step program that God showed me out of the story of the prodigal son in reference to reconciliation, in order to be fully reconciled, is a four-step pro program. How many? Four points needed to have a complete, I have complete spirit of reconciliation. Let's go back to several texts, okay? The first text that we have here says in verse 16, 17, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and have, have no, I'm sorry, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, how many high servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare, and I perish with what? What kind of spirit is this? I just heard it. The spirit of what? That's step number one. Before to be rec fully reconciled, you got to have the spirit of what? You got to be humble. That's hard for a lot of people. I'm talking about the people in the church. Husbands, let me tell you something. Learn to be humble with your wives. Even if she is messed up, be humble with them. I I'm serious. The church was messed up too. But was Christ humble with us? We represent Christ. Am I right? Ephesians chapter 5. I know it's hard for us. I can't stand this woman, right? We get that. But let me tell you something. The spirit of Christ would tell us otherwise. Second point, <clears throat> found in verse 18. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have what? I guess who? And before thee. What kind of, what, listen to, let, let me repeat it again because it might throw you off track a little bit. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have what? And before thee. What spirit is this? Very good. The spirit of confession. I need you to understand, before confession, you have to be humbled. Yes or no? Then proceeds confession. And then here, in verse 19, and am no more worthy to be called thy son, make me as one of thy hired what? What spirit is this? The spirit of impartiality. I seek no favoritism here. I know I'm your son, but I'm going to get used to it. I usually get all this. No, I don't want that. This is true. This is hitting me. I need it right. Are you with me? 
You seek nothing in return. Are you following me, folks? This is the third part, the third step that a lot of people fail on. Then lastly, it says here, and he arose and came to his father. When he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, I'm going to focus here on the father. What kind of spirit did he have? Spirit of forgiveness. I need you to understand something. The one that has offended and the one that, has, um, that offends have a role to play in order to have complete reconciliation. Are you hearing what I just said? The three starts with the offended, I mean the offense, uh, the, off the, the offender, thank you. The offender, the one is dealing with the offended. There's no way that you and I can have complete reconciliation with one another. You with your husband, your, your spouse, with your, uh, rather your wife with your husbands, or a husband with wives, or with your children, the church, if you don't do your part as the receiving end to the bitterness, if you will, of the hatred or whatever, you got to be ready to forgive. Yes or no? You got to be ready to forgive. You want to say something to this? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I went, I went a little bit ahead. Who's being moved by this so far? Raise your hand if you're being moved by this. This is true revival, folks. I, re I said it last night, and I'm going to repeat it again. I could come here and give you all of what's happening on Capitol Hill to the world. What good is that if we don't get this straight? What good is that? Dr. O already came over here last week. He gave you all that. Now it's time to get ready. You want your church to get this right. Listen, the best thing you can have is a church that really loves people. But you're not going to love people. You can't love your own people. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5, I mean, chapter 22, verse 37, 39. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy what? And with all thy what? And with all thy what? This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like to it. What does it say? Who's your neighbor? The one that's sitting right next to you. Yes, that's including your wife, husbands. Amen. That is your children. Amen. I know we could be so rude. I mean, we could be so rude to our children. Woo! Now, don't misunderstand because some children need to get a good thing. And I've said that already. I know some of you need to get rid of it. But listen, after you give them a good one, I mean, a real good one, take them and embrace them. Do you know Spirit of Poverty tells us that we need to do that? When we discipline them, we have to let them know why we did it, but we need to show them that we love them. Are you with me, folks? I failed that in my upbringing with my children or the upbringing of my children. I lack that. And that's why I tell people and I warn people don't do it. I'm like the prisoner that gets out of prison and says, listen, don't do this. This is what's going to happen to you. I don't ever claim perfection. I don't ever claim the perfection, but I do claim experience. Are you hearing me? And experience will help somebody to know don't do this. And that's what I'm trying to offer to people. All right? Now, the third and final statement from this book, Five Biology um, Languages, says this. To forgive opens the door of what? To what? Not to forgive leads to further deterioration of... Oh, I think I've already read that. Sorry. I did, read, right? This is the one I wanted to come to. Listen to this one. Lawrence, I never met this guy. I just saw this. I said, I got to include this. Only the what? Know how to? A coward never. We're not talking about the apology here. We're talking about you and the receiving end. Yes, the one that hurt you. You could have suffered a divorce. And that husband of yours could have done something so bad, or that wife of yours could have done so bad. Listen, folks, you even have to forgive that person. You know, it's very interesting. It's just um, three weeks ago, I was given this sermon, right? Given this sermon. And when I was done, a lady came to me. She goes, you know what? While you were given this sermon, while you were talking about the prodigal son, she felt that she needed to get on the phone. She started texting her own children, saying, I am sorry. Not but, but, but. I am sorry. Please forgive me. I said, sis, you did one of the best things to save your children. You, can, you and I can never say that our children are going to be in heaven if they don't see the spirit of reconciliation with us. How can they be reconciled to God when we're not being reconciled with one another? We're the hypocrites then. It is not in his nature. Going back to John the Baptist real quick, and I'm going to talk on this real quick, just another point, Okay. <clears throat> Albert Barnes, last statement. So now you know what this all means. Listen to this. 
John came that he might ally these animosities and produce better feeling by directing them all to the one, to what? The Messiah would, he would, I'm sorry, the Messiah, he would divert their attention from the causes of their difference and bring them to, did you cast that? He would do what? Peace where? And reconcile those parents and children who had chosen different what? And who had suffered their attachment to sect to interrupt the harmony of their what? That was the spirit of John the Baptist. We need to start living that here today. Is the spirit moving you? I would sure hope so. You know if you, you have this disagreement, you're disgruntled with your children or whoever, you know who you are. This message is for you. If you want them in heaven, you now have to probably apologize or call them up and say, I finally forgive you. Are you with me? The effect of true religion on a family will always be to produce what? Would you say amen to that? It attaches all the family to one great master, and by attachment to him, all minor causes of differences are all right. Everybody, all right? Who wants their sins to be forgotten? Guess what? You got to do the same. In other words, don't hold this against them. And again, I got to hit on this. I'm sorry, because it's dealing with the family. Wives, and it happens more with the wives than the husband, but it happens with the husband more. How can something that you did 20 years ago always resurface 20 years later? No true forgiveness. That's the reason why. Please, spouses, stop doing that. Settle it with God. If your husband or your wife continues to do it, listen, that's their problem with God. It becomes your problem when you don't forgive. It will always be that problem. Are you with me? You got, listen, I, you know how I deal with my wife? Not so much as my wife. You know how I deal with her? As a sister in Christ. That brings on a different meaning, doesn't it? Because I got to love her as my sister in Christ. Because when we're in heaven, she ain't going to be my, man, my wife no more. Right? Am I right with that? She's going to be my wife. For we will be as the angels. Yes or no? So guess what? I have to start treating her as so. Now granted, she has more prominence in my life because she's my other half now. Amen? So I have to treat her with that type of love and respect. And where I have done wrong, I have to come and apologize to her. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. We're about to wind down. For if, when we were what, everyone? We were reconciled to who? By the death of his son. Much more being, we shall be saved by his life. Folks, who really wants to be part of this crowd? I will submit to you, those that are there have become fully reconciled. Not only with God, but with one another. But folks, let me make this very clear. Because I always, typically, I, this is what the question that I have. I have people say, well, Ernest, what is it? I mean, how is it? That, I mean, oh, forgive me, forgive me. How about if the one that you're trying to reconcile does not want to speak with you? You know what I say to them? Your job and your responsibility is to make the effort. And by the way, don't make excuses. Don't go to the brother and say, well, or sister and say, well, listen, this is this, I'm sorry for what it is, but this, that, and the other. But this, that, and the other. But you know why I did it? Leave all that out. Leave all that out. That's not true. That's not true humility, folks. Leave all that out. They know all that. You're making excuses then. Listen, I'm sorry for doing this. I'm sorry for yelling at you. Listen, do you forgive me? What should be their next response? If they don't, you've already washed your hands. You've done your part. Now the problem becomes be between them and God. You can walk around. You can walk back justified now. Amen? That's how it works. But you have a role to play. And if you're the, if you're the one that has offended, you have more of the work that you have to work with. You, that's, I'm sorry. This is the way that it works. But the greater thing is, is when the one that you offended says, I'm sorry, let's get back together. Amen? And let me tell you something. Spouses, do that. Please do that. Please do that. You would notice that your relationship would grow so much greater. Your intimacy, intimacy level will, will skyrocket. I'm telling you, folks. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You will see changes. And if you are not with somebody, 
then you know what? If there's anything you can do, do it. Are you with me? Just do it. And if you can't do anything, come to the Lord and ask him for forgiveness. Are you with me? But let me tell you something. If there comes a time that you are presented the opportunity, you better take it. Let me give you an example of this as I close. Hold up. I got less than an hour. You started late, didn't you? He was about to say no, Ernest, but he looked at me. Years ago, when I first got into the church, right, I got into the church, or I came back into the church around in 2005. I remember I was gone hope for the Lord. I was gone hope for the Lord. And I remember I went to this camp meeting, and then they were offering up, I mean, to, to go ahead and baptize people. And I felt like I was ready. I felt like I was ready. So they asked for hands to come up. Hands came up. I was one of them, right? And what happened was that after the meeting, they asked everyone that wanted to be baptized to come and sit down on the round table, if you will. They had more chairs more, if you will. And we sat down. So they were going over the points of, of our doctrine, what we believe, you know, the things that they should, to make sure we were acquainted with that and we knew what we were getting ourselves into. And by the way, when I go to teach these things to non-believers, like the prisoners, I don't just baptize them because they want to get and they want to get baptized. Anybody can get wet. The devil can get wet for all I care. Okay, but what I tell him, I said, listen, before you get baptized, you're going to know what we believe. You know why? God is tired of having bar part timers in the church. He needs full timers. What do you say? Anyway, so going back to the story. So I got in uh, when uh, we were talking. He said to me, I remember that the pastor said to me, or he said to you, just the whole people. He said, listen, is there anybody here that you have had issues with in the past? Because if you have, you got to go make it right before we baptize you. That, to me, that was unheard. Of. I said, what are you talking about, brother? I mean, come on, man, that's past. We will not baptize anyone unless you reconcile with that person. The first person that came up was my uncle. Now we're about a year apart. He's two year, about a year older than me. But we grew up like almost brothers, you know, brothers, you know what I'm saying? But I felt always that he was the one that was baby. He was the one that always lifted up, and I got the brunt of things. That was the way that it was. And I lived with my grandmother. That was my uncle. So, of course, guess who got, guess who got preference? He did. Okay? So, I was a, I supposedly I was a favorite now, um, um, a grandson. But when it came to him, no, it didn't happen, right? So what happened was that he first came to my mind. It's like, all right. So I said, before I, I want to get baptized, but I got to make it right with him. So I said, let me find the number that I only know. And I tried calling. I tried calling him. I tried calling. And I, I could never get through. And I said, Lord, I want to get baptized. But I, can't, he, I, I said, he doesn't, get, um, he doesn't pick up his phone. So finally, I said, forget it, Lord. I did what I could do. I'm going to go talk to the pastor and let him know. I said, listen, pastor. And I talked to him. I said, pastor, listen, I tried to. God knows I did. I tried to. I said, I know that that was one of the requirements. But my question to you is, if I promise you that when I have the opportunity to apologize to him or get things right, that I'll do it, would you still baptize me? He goes, I'll take your word for it. I got baptized. That was the greatest day of my life. I got baptized. Fast forward, probably about a year and a half later, probably about that. It's forgotten. I haven't seen him. Don't talk to him. Don't live in the same city nor on their state. I go visit my grandmother, and lo and behold, he walks in. I see him there, and it just dawned on me, the covenant that I made with that pastor. And I said, oh, man. I really don't like him, though. <laughs> but my conscience was hitting me. Ernest, yes, you made that covenant with that man, but you know what? That man stood, stood in my place. You actually made it with me. What are you going to do about it? I said, so-and-so, can you come outside? And he came outside. We started looking out. No. Well, he came outside. He came outside. I said, listen, I just want to apologize to you for all the things that I've done wrong to you. I do apologize. I'm sorry. I didn't give him no excuses. You know what he did? He said, it's interesting that you're telling me that. Because all this time that I heard that you got baptized, I was always wondering if it was genuine. I said, what? Need I also tell you that he never apologized to me? I left it alone. I felt justified. Fast forward 10 years. I had to go to Orlando to do a, um, a funeral for one of our friends that was one of part of the club. We used to run the streets and everything. I had to go out there. I'm requested to do a funeral for them. 
I go out there, it's just a couple years ago, just a couple years ago, but that was in 2005 when I got baptized, keep that in mind, right? So now this is probably about four years ago, it's four or five years ago, I have to go out to Orlando because somebody that we know, it was a good friend of ours, almost like a brother, died. I go out there, I'm at that, I'm getting ready to walk into the house, and then I get a phone call on my cell phone. I pick up the cell phone, I notice this, my uncle, I said, that brother barely ever calls me. The brother only calls me whenever he's drunk, and that's really, ever, 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 ever. I look at the phone and said, man, I'm about to walk in the house. Forget it. Let me go pick it up. I said, yeah. And then we started talking. Well, this, that, and the other about the individuals. Do you think they're going to let me go to the house? I, said, I don't think it's going to be a problem. Just come to the house. He said, well, but, you know, we had an issue. Before. I said, listen, don't worry about it. I said, listen, I got to get ready to go. He said, no, 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 Ernest, I got to still talk to you about something. I said, okay. I'm like, come on, hurry up. And he starts talking and rambling with words and everything like that. I said, no, I said, listen, don't worry, we're talking. No, 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 I still got to talk to you about something. And I said, and in my mind, I said, what is it that's so important? He said, you know what, that time that you came and apologized to me, that was years earlier. And I said, what is he talking about? He said, remember the time? I said, I said, I don't remember. And he reminded me, I said, I said, oh, listen, don't worry about it. That's done and over with. I said, I'm not even sweating that. I'm not worried about it. He goes, no, no, no. You're not worried about it, but I have been worried about it since. You know what he just did now? He apologized to me. It's been torturing him for over 10 years. But I was free. I was free. And we were able to fully reconcile with one another. Who wants this type of experience, folks? I want it. But we have to do our part. Are you guys following what I'm saying? We have to do our part. Without our part, we get nowhere. We go nowhere. Folks, including, time is running out. Time is running out. How much time you got to apologize? Oh, I'll wait till about 10 years from now. Ernest gave me an example, 20 years. Folks, listen, let me, let me tell you something. You are not guaranteed that you'll even make it out that door today. And if you're hearing a message, message like this and you are rejecting it, you are rejecting God himself. And God cannot seal you if you don't do what he has asked you to do. Are you with me? I know we think that we're going to make it back here next week. Well, it doesn't work that way. Life is a life of sin. And sin is an equal opportunity employer. And sin is eager to take you down. Are you with me? So let's get right with God. Amen?